what a great reminder it is that we have a God who walks with us even in the valley of the shadow of death. This brother Noble that we heard about today, he's from our home assembly back in India, just a couple of years older than me. Um, I remember him playing guitar and leading a youth group and things of that nature. Just a very sad news to wrap your head around. Um, but as we heard, we have a God who loves us, who is with us, even as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. God's presence is the greatest antidote for fear and for anxiety. And we thank God for his continued presence with us. May we continue to pray for that grieving family. I also thank the Lord for this opportunity that we have to gather around his word and to look at the precious truths of scripture. As we have come to study the Bible today, um, my plan is to um, study a topic, um, in fact, uh, an object that's mentioned in the Old Testament, which uh, beautifully pictures for us the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. The title of our study today is Christ as he's pictured in the ark. Christ as he's pictured in the ark. There are three arks that are mentioned in the Bible, um, all of them in the Old Testament, and all of them pictures Christ in some way or form. And we are going to um, do a survey of them what are the three arcs that are mentioned in the Bible? The first one, obviously, is the most popular one that everyone knows about. Even the Sunday school, Sunday school students know about this one. The Ark of Noah. What does that picture for us? It pictures for us the deliverance from the wrath of God. The second arc that we read about is from Exodus chapter 2. It is the ark where baby Moses was put so that he could be delivered from Pharaoh and his people. And it pictures for us deliverance from the bondage of sin. And the third arc that we read about is throughout the Bible, but really uh, the instructions are given in Exodus chapter 25, is the Ark of the Covenant. And that's another um, object that very beautifully pictures for us the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So may we look at these and see what truths we can learn from this and how in each of these arcs, we see the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. My desire is that as we do this study, we would exalt the Lord Jesus Christ in our hearts that our love towards him would grow that we would be better followers of him, that we would imitate him daily in our lives and his glory and his um, exaltation would be the true pursuit of our life. Let's turn um, to Genesis chapter six. That's where we read about the Ark of Noah, Noah's Ark. And like I said, it, it uh, pictures for us deliverance from God's wrath. Genesis chapter six, and we'll start reading from verse five on. Um, this is what we read. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I'm sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God, and Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me. 
for the earth is filled up with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and outside with pitch. We'll stop here for now. Here we read the background for the story of Noah's ark. The earth was corrupt. People were wicked. Wickedness has, had increased exponentially. We read in verse 5 that every intent of the thought of the hearts of men were evil continually. What a situation is that? What grief this must have caused in God's heart. He determines to kill and destroy all the living things, all uh, people on the earth. He tells Noah to build an ark so that his life may be preserved. He is planning to send floodwaters on the earth to drown everything that was alive. And most interestingly, there is this one verse, verse 8, that's tucked in between in that passage. It says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And that's the first point I want to mention under this. Noah's ark was God's provision of grace. God's provision of grace. Yes, wickedness had increased on earth. God's plan was to destroy mankind. Yet Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. God didn't owe Noah anything. He didn't need to preserve Noah. He could have killed Noah just like he was planning on killing everyone else. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Beloved, when we extend that to us, isn't this what God has done with us? We were included in the sinners. When we read Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, it tells us that all had sinned and all had fallen short of God's glory. We didn't deserve a provision of grace, yet God extended a provision of grace for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. By grace, we have been saved. When we come to him, we receive salvation. Noah was given a provision of grace through the ark. We are given a provision of grace through the Lord Jesus Christ. What an amazing privilege. When we continue to read that passage, um, if we read from verses 17 to 20, we read a contrast. Let's read verses 17 to 20 of chapter 6 of Genesis. And behold, I myself am bringing floodwaters on the earth, to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which the breath of life, everything that is on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall go into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And every living thing of all flesh you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female of the birds of their kind after their kind, of the animals after their kind, and of every creeping thing of the earth after its kind, two of every kind will come into the ark, will come to you to keep them alive. So here we see a contrast of life and death. Here God says everything that's in the ark will be kept alive. Everything that was outside the ark shall die. A contrast of life and death. The ark to Noah was God's provision for safety. Everything that was inside the ark would be kept safe, would be kept alive. Everything that was outside of the ark would be destroyed, would be dead, would face condemnation. Beloved, this is what we have been given to. The ark, the Lord Jesus Christ. In Ephesians chapter 2, we read that we were dead in our trespasses and sins, but we have been made alive with him. When we come to him, we are made alive doesn't Peter tell us this also, that we, when we come to him, the chief cornerstone, we are made living stones. He is the source of life. Jesus says this in John chapter 10, that the thief comes. He comes to kill, to destroy, and to steal. But Jesus has come so that we may have life and life abundantly. He is the source of life. In him was life, and life was the light of men. John tells us he is the very source of life. When we come to the ark, the Lord Jesus Christ, we are given life. We are given safety. So we see this ark was God's provision of safety for Noah. Everything inside the ark was kept safe, was kept alive. 
Then the third thing that we read about the ark is that it was God's provision for salvation. And it's it's found throughout where chapter 7 of Genesis. And we'll read some verses uh, to see this. God's provision for salvation. Let's read verse 1 of chapter 7. It says, Then the Lord said to Noah, Come into the ark, you and all your household. Here we see the first point under this, God's invitation. God is telling Noah, Come, you and all, all of your household into the ark. God invites Noah into the ark. Beloved, we have received this invitation. We have received the invitation to come to the Lord Jesus Christ for our salvation. Jesus says this, right, in the Gospels. Come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And that's exactly what he does. When we come to him, when we are at the end of our rope, not being able to, to carry this burden of sin, when we come to him, he gives us rest. We also see the invitation in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. Come now, let us reason together. Says the Lord, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they, sh they shall become like wool. God invites us for salvation. Come into the ark so that you may receive salvation. So we see God's invitation here in Genesis 7 and verse 1. We also see that this invitation was not an invitation that lasted forever. It was an expiring invitation. When we go to chapter 7 and verse 10, we read that it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were on the earth. This invitation was time bound. People who uh, should heed that invitation needed to come to the ark in an appointed time. After that, it was too late. It was an expiring invitation. Beloved, we are also given an invitation. There will be uh, coming a time when God will shut the door of this ark, when the age of grace will end. That's why there, there are admonitions, there are warnings uh, given by the apostles, where it says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Apostle Paul says, behold, now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. There's an urgency to this because it's an expiring invitation. We also see that it is an invitation by God. It is an expiring invitation. It is also a specific invitation. They couldn't just come any way they like. There was one door to the ark. And whoever needed to come to the ark needed to come through that one door. And God would shut the door at a certain given time. Beloved, we hear people say you can come to God any way you like. There are several ways to God and so on and so forth. But Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There is one specific way we must come to the ark. He says, I am the door. We must come through that door. So here we have a specific invitation. And finally, we see when we accept this invitation, when we um, get there in the appointed time, when we come through the prescribed door, it is finally a saving invitation, a saving invitation. We read in chapter 7 and verses 22 and 23 this. Verse 22 says, all in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life, all was on the dry land, died. So he destroyed all living things which were on the face of the ground, both man and cattle, creeping thing and bird of the air. They were destroyed from the earth. Only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive. Noah and all who were with him remained alive. It was a saving invitation. Whoever came to the ark was kept safe. They were, they were kept alive. And beloved, when we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, it is a saving invitation. In Acts chapter 16, we read, um, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. When we come in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ, when we come to our ark of salvation, we are saved from the wrath of God. 
Finally, there's one more point I want to make about the Ark of Noah and we'll move on. Uh, when we go to chapter 8 of Genesis and verse 4, this is what we read. Then the Ark rested in the seventh month, uh, the 17th day of the month on the mountains of Ararat. The ark rested on the mountain of Ararat. And what that marked for Noah was a new beginning. After this, what would happen? Noah and his family would get out of the ark. They would go out into the world. They would repopulate the earth under a new promise of protection that God offers them. A new beginning was given. When we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, it says that we are become, we, we become a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are new. It marks a new beginning for us. There's an interesting detail here um, about the time. It says that on the seventh, um, in the seventh month, the 17th day of the month, many scholars believe that this is the exact date. If you study the, the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, that it was the exact time that that also took place. Um, and if that is, then what an interesting thing that is. So here we see God's provision of grace, God's provision for safety, God's provision for salvation, and finally God's provision for a new beginning. Beloved, Christ Jesus is our ark. This is what we read in Romans chapter 5 and verse 9. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. We shall be saved from wrath through him. We have been delivered from God's wrath because of the Lord Jesus Christ. Noah's ark pictured deliverance from God's wrath. Christ gives us deliverance from God's wrath. Let's move on to the next ark, which is the ark of Moses. And again, this pictures for us deliverance from the bondage of sin. Let's uh, turn to the story in, Genesis cha in Exodus chapter 2. Exodus chapter 2, and we know the backstory to this. Um, the children of Israel are in Egypt. They are under bondage of Pharaoh. And um, they cry out to God, and God raises up a deliverer in Moses. Um, but there is a decree that was uh, passed by Pharaoh that all the male children should be killed. And as a result, um, the parents of Moses, they prepare an ark so that they could hide Moses from Pharaoh and his people. Let's pick up the story in Exodus chapter 2, and we'll read a few verses there. Exodus chapter 2, verse 1. And a man of the house of Levi went and took as wife a daughter of Levi. So the woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw uh, that he was a beautiful child, she hid him three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes for him, daubed it with asphalt and pitch, put the child in it, and laid it in the reeds by the river's bank. And his sister stood afar off to, uh, to know what would be done with him. Then the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe in the river, and her maidens walked along the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it. And when she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby wept. So she had compassion on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. So here we see uh, the detail of, of what happens with this ark. The parents, they tried to hide the baby. Um, they hid successfully for three months. After that, they could no longer do that. They couldn't think of any other options. They, were, um, they had come to the end of their line. And in an act of desperation, they go for this move. They prepare an ark. They don't know the outcome of this. They're doing this completely in faith. There's a good chance that the baby could be harmed, that the baby might die. They don't know. But this is the best they can do. So in complete reliance on God, in complete faith in God, in complete desperation, they built an ark. So the first point I want to make here is that this was a provision made in faith. Beloved, when we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, this is the same thing we do. We come in desperation. We know that we are sinners. There is nothing we can do to save us. There is nothing in ourselves that is good. We come to him saying, thou must save and thou alone. And uh, we, in faith, believe in him. 
And when we come to him, he says, I will in no way cast you out. He receives us and he gives us the right to be called the children of God. That's what we read in um, John chapter 1, verse 12, right? As many as received him, to them he gave the right to be called the children of God. So here is a provision made in faith, a provision made in desperation, a provision that grants deliverance from the bondage of sin. The second point is the same that we considered earlier also. It was a provision made for safety. The baby was kept in the ark. Outside the ark was water. Outside the ark was death. Inside the ark was safety and life. And as, as long as that baby was kept inside the ark, it prevented water from getting in. You know, Egypt is a picture of the world. It's a picture of um, the influences of, of, of the world, the bondage that, uh, that sin um, has on us. And the ark protected the baby uh, from um, being drowned, from being destroyed. And the same way, Jesus offers us that safety, that life, just as we uh, talked about earlier. And finally, it is a provision that resulted in deliverance. We know Moses was raised up as the deliverer, um, the person who would lead uh, the people of Israel out, out of the bondage of Egypt. Um, let's turn to Exodus chapter 3, the next chapter. And we will read verses 9 and 10. And this is God talking to Moses. He says, Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me. And I have also seen the oppression which, um, with which the Egyptians oppress them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. God commissions Moses to go out and deliver his people out of the land of Egypt. And we know the story. We know that um, God, through his mighty uh, power, uh, brings the people out of that land and uses Moses powerfully to do that. And um, uh, we, we see that this, this act resulted in a great act, uh, this resulted in a great act of deliverance from God's uh, part. So again, the ark that kept um, the, Moses' life safe resulted in a great deliverance. We are also, beloved, given a great deliverance from the bondage of sin. Jesus in his own words said in John chapter 8 and verse 38, uh, so if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. We have been set free by the Son. We are, we are set free from the bondage of sin. In Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1, we read the same thing. For freedom, Christ has set us free. We are no longer slaves to sin. We are no longer slaves to the bondage of Egypt. We have been set free. Again, the Ark of Moses shows us deliverance from the bondage of sin. Let's move on to the third ark. The third ark is the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant uh, is, a, is an article that was um, in the tabernacle. Probably um, the most important of all the articles because this was where the presence of God, the Shekinah glory of God rested. Um, and it, it beautifully pictures, again, the, present, uh, the, the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's read about this ark. God gives instructions to build this ark. And we read about this in Exodus chapter 25. Exodus chapter 25. And if we read from verse 10 on, we will see this. Uh, let's read this. Exodus chapter 25, starting with verse 10. And they shall make an ark of acacia wood. Two and a half cubits shall be its length. A cubit and a half its width and a cubit and a half its height. And you shall overlay it with pure gold. Inside and out you shall overlay it. And you shall make it on molding of gold all around it. You shall cast four rings of gold for it and put them in its four corners. Two rings shall be on, um, on one side and two rings on the other side. And you shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. You shall put the poles into the rings on the side of the ark that the ark may be carried by them. The poles shall be in the rings of the ark. They shall not be taken from it. And you shall put into the ark the testimony which I give you. You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two and a half cubits shall be its length and cubit and a half its width. 
and you shall make two cherubims of gold of hammered hammered work you shall make them um, make them at two ends of the mercy seat make one cherub at one end and the other cherub at the other end you shall make the cherubim at the two ends of it one piece with the mercy seat and the cherubim shall stretch out its wings over uh, uh, wings above covering the mercy seat with their wings and they shall face one another and the faces of the cherubim shall to shall be toward the mercy seat you shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark and the ark you shall put uh, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that i will give you and there i will meet with you and i will speak with you from above the mercy seat from between the two cherubim which are on the ark of the testimony about everything which i give you in commandment to the children of israel so here we see the instructions of building the ark of the covenant and the first uh, thing i want us to consider this uh, consider is this that this ark pictures for us the nature of the person of christ the nature of the person of christ we read in verses 10 and 11 of chapter 25 the materials by um, with which this ark should be built it should be built with acacia wood and it should be overlaid with gold so here is one object that's made with two materials beloved this shows forth the nature of the lord jesus christ the dual nature of the lord jesus christ how he was both man and god what does the wood show the wood comes from a tree it talks about something that's coming from the earth something that's natural it's talking about the humanity of the lord jesus christ the gold on the other hand is talking about the divinity his God, his, uh, he, him being God. And uh, we see the ark was made with wood, overlaid with gold, and beautifully pictures for us the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ. We read this uh, throughout the New Testament, but we all especially read this in Philippians chapter 2. Being in the form of God, he did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, coming in the likeness of man. This was the word became flesh that John talks about. The God of heaven came, came, coming down, taking human flesh. The God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ. What a great picture of that is seen in the Ark of the Covenant. The second thing that I want to point out there is that the Ark pictures for us the perfection of the work of Christ. The perfection of the work of Christ. How does it do that? It does that through the contents of the Ark. There were three things that were contained in the Ark. And we can read about that in, from verses in Exodus and Numbers um, and so on. But there is one verse which summarizes it pretty well in the New Testament. If you go to Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 4, Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 4, it's uh, mentioned there. Um, if you read from verse 3 on, it says, And behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, and here it is, in which were the golden pot that had manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. Here there are three things that are mentioned. Three things that were contained in the Ark of the Covenant. Three things. What are they? The golden jar containing manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of stone. Beloved, each of these things shows forth the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we consider the manna, the jar of manna, we know the story of manna. Israel complained that they didn't have food and God rained bread from heaven. This was God's provision that he made for the Israelites for their sustenance in the wilderness. And Jesus said he was the bread of life. When we go to John chapter 6, John chapter 6, and uh, when we read from verse 47 on, this is what Jesus says. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which, you, which comes down from heaven, the one, that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I, which I shall give for the life of the world. Here, Jesus pictures him as the bread from heaven. The manna that came down from heaven, who, uh, who was given for the whole world his flesh was broken on that cross 
coming to him, feeding on him. As we take him in, we become recipients of the life that he offers, the bread from heaven. It shows his perfect work on the cross. When we consider the second object, Aaron's rod that budded, we know the story of uh, the rod um, that budded. This was when Korah and uh, some of the people uh, rebelled against God's appointed authority. And God wanted to point out who he had appointed as priest over Israel. And God asked them to lay uh, their rods on um, on the ground and overnight. Um, and when they had come back and observed what had happened, Aaron's rod had budded. Not just budded, it had leaves, it had flowers, it had fruit. Beloved, this shows forth the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Something that came to life, something that was dead, coming to life and life abundant. Lord Jesus Christ, he died, but he rose again. And he lives in that life abundant for us for forever. What a great picture. In um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we are told that he, um, he has become the first fruits for us. Uh, it says in verse 20, But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. What a great uh, hope we have. Even as we talk about these news of death and all those things that surround us, this is the thing that gives us the greatest hope, that Christ has risen. And that's an indication because he is the first fruit. And the first fruit is always an indication that there is more to come. And it indicates for us that when we die, we will be raised up in glory. Aaron's rod that budded, showing forth the resurrection of Christ. And finally, the stones of uh, stones of tab, uh, the tablets of stones. We know that this represented the law. And... Uh, the law was a picture um, of what man could not do. I mean, this was God's perfect law. No one could keep the law. All it could do was point out guilt. There was only one person who followed the law unto its fulfillment, and that was the Lord Jesus Christ. He became the fulfillment of the law. The law could not save, but Jesus Christ, he became our savior. That's what we read in Romans chapter 8, right? Romans chapter 8. And when we read verse 3, this is what it says, for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. The law could not save, but Jesus Christ became uh, the savior for us. The law was fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, a perfect picture of the work of Christ. So all these three things, all these three things, uh, the manna, the, the rod that budded, the tablets of stone, they all show forth the perfect work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, one more point that I want to make, and uh, we'll finish here. Um, it shows the beauty of the propitiation of Christ, the beauty of the propitiation of Christ. For this, we have to consider the mercy seat, the mercy seat. We already read about this. What was the mercy seat? It was an object made with uh, pure gold. And it was, um, if you will, the lid to the Ark of the Covenant. It, it went on top of the Ark of the Covenant. It shows forth the propitiation that we have through Christ. The three things that we mentioned um, shows forth the work of Christ. But you know what else it shows? It also shows for the rebellion of man. All these three things had a backstory to it, which involved the rebellion of the Israelites. When manna came, we know manna came as a result of their murmuring and their complaining. Even after God gave them the manna, they didn't follow the instruction and God called them a stiff-necked people. Aaron's rod, we already talked about it. This came as a rebellion of people against God's established authority. Again, a story of rebellion. The stones we know as God gave Moses these, these tablets and he came down the mountain. What did he see? He saw Israel engage in gross idolatry. All these things had to do with man's rebellion. When we look at these three objects, 
it would remind us of the sin that was in people, sin that was in uh, the hearts of, of those people. But there was a covering, a covering that went over that ark so that the rebellion would not be seen. A mercy seat covered the contents of the ark. So that when God looks at us, God looks at it, he does not see this rebellion. He sees the mercy seat. And it was on the mercy seat that the, the high priest sprinkled blood on the day of atonement. The blood covers the rebellion of people. Beloved, you know what uh, Apostle Paul says in uh, Romans 3 and verse 25, Romans chapter 3 and verse 25. Uh, if you read from verse 24 on, this is what we read. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance God has passed over the sins that were, that were previously committed. The word there, propitiation, that can be literally translated mercy seat. Christ became our mercy seat. When God looks at us, he does not see our sin. He does not see our rebellion. He sees Christ who covers us, our mercy seat. He sees his imputed righteousness upon us. And he sees us just as holy as Lord Jesus Christ. The ark the mercy seat pictures for us the beauty of the propitiation of Christ. We'll stop here. Just to round up what we discussed, Christ is our ark. He is the ark that delivers us from the wrath of God. He is the ark that delivers us from the bondage of sin. He is the ark that has become the propitiation for our sins. As we think about this, as we consider these thoughts, May it help us to love him more, to worship him more, to be better followers of him. May the desire of our heart be to always follow steadfastly after him. Even as we prepare our hearts for tomorrow to come and remember this one who gave himself for, for us. May we, may, may our God, Help these thoughts to encourage us and stir up our hearts. May his name be glorified.